I'm gonna share a story in scripture that's been really challenging me in the way that I engage with my thinking about purpose and calling and destiny. We all want our life to count for something. And the, the title of my message this morning is God's Amazing Plan for Your Life. Now, this is a statement that I'd be hard pressed to ever use, let alone title a sermon with it, because sometimes I think it, it lacks a proper explanation. And without a proper explanation, it can paint this kind of false portrait in your mind about what your life might look like. And I'm gonna use it today because it speaks to a tension that I felt in my life. And I know others have felt it. We have a Bible school here where young people come from all around the world. And I know this is a tension that young people feel as well. And usually when a statement like this is made, God has an amazing plan for your life. There's some kind of parallel drawn to a hero of faith in scripture. Right? You might talk about David and how he fought Goliath. You might talk about Moses freeing the children of Israel, about Esther, uh, about the apostles, these simple men who submitted their lives to God and, and he turned the world upside down with them. And they did incredible things for his glory. But I'm gonna parallel God's amazing plan for your life with a character in the Bible that maybe isn't typically used. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the story of Jonathan, the son of King Saul. Uh, to do that, I'm gonna just briefly go over the timeline of Jonathan's life. And I wanna provide you, the goal is to provide you with different snapshots of his life over time to highlight aspects of his character. And, and I'm going somewhere with that because it leads to this question that I asked myself, that has really given me some clarity on God's a, a plan for my life. And I think that it'll, it'll speak to yours as well. And so as we go into this text, these passages, hang on with me, because we're gonna cover a lot of ground. There's portions that start in 1 Samuel chapter nine, going all the way to Samuel chapter 31. Obviously we're not gonna read all of that scripture because it would take a long time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, provide a brief summary of what's happening during this time period and then highlight certain portions of scripture to read for us that um, are specifically relevant to our topic this morning. Before going into some of those snapshots, just to summarize some of the key figures and some of the key events that took place in these 23 chapters, there's four key figures in, in, in these 23 chapters. You have Samuel, who was the prophet and judge in Israel who, who played, a, he played a crucial rule or a crucial role in guiding and advising the Israelites during this period. He was, he was like a spiritual um, guide at the, at the time. So you have Samuel, you have Saul, who was the first king of Israel. He, had, he started out as a promising young king, but because of disobedience to God's commands paired with an unrepentant heart, it leads to his downfall. And then you have David, who most of us are familiar with. We, we all know the story of David and Goliath. David, this, this young shepherd boy who gains prominence when he fights Goliath the giant and defeats him. Um, and eventually he becomes king after Saul's death. And he's one of the most significant figures in the Bible. And then there's Jonathan. He was the son of King Saul and a close friend to David. So these, these are the key figures that you'll read about in these chapters. And then to kind of explain and summarize what's happening during this time period, 1 Samuel chapter 9 through 31, it, re it recounts a change in Israel's governance. So Israel, for the longest time, God was their king. God was their ruler. And, and there came a point where they're crying out, they want a, their own king. They want to be like all the other nations with their own king. And so their request for a king is granted. And it begins with the humble origins of Saul, who's chosen king, the, the, the prophet Samuel anoints King Saul. And Saul initially gains the popularity of the people by defeating Israel's enemies. But later on, as he's operating and walking in disobedience to God, God tells him that his kingdom is gonna be rejected and God is gonna find a new king. God is gonna find someone, a man after his own heart to replace him. That man, of course, is David. 
And David, you know, amidst, amidst various conflicts with the Philistines who were the enemy of Israel, David rises as this hero by defeating Goliath. And of course, Saul, all the while, he's growing in his jealousy uh, towards David. And he starts to pursue to try to kill David because he's afraid that David is gonna take his throne away from him. And the, the section of scripture, it concludes with the tragic death of Saul and his son, Jonathan, and his other sons. So this is a general summary of what's happening during this time period that serves as a foundation. Now what I wanna do, I wanna look at snapshots of Jonathan's life that led me to ask this question. So Jonathan first comes into the scene in 1 Samuel chapter 13, where he's fighting the Philistines with his father, Saul. And the very next chapter, 14, it tells the first prominent story of Jonathan in scripture. He's, uh, he, he takes his armor bearer, one other young man, and he inspires Israel through his actions to fight against their enemies. He, he takes his armor bearer without his father knowing, without the rest of uh, the men knowing. And in 1 Samuel 14, 6, this is what he says to the armor, his, this young man. He said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Pay attention to this. He says, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. He's saying, listen, if, if these are our enemies and God is truly on our side, it doesn't matter whether we have a thousand of us fighting against them or it's just you and me and, and, and we're attacking. God's able to deliver by many or by few. And so he ends up going in faith and they kill 20 of their enemies and they create this panic in the camp of the Philistines. The Philistines are completely panicked and Israel hears this panic. And Saul eventually rallies Israel into battle and there's this great victory that takes place. So if, if you're looking at character traits of Jonathan in this first snapshot, there's a few different things you see. You see, number one, he's a man of faith. You, know, you, you think David standing before Goliath takes faith. Try going into the enemy's camp where there are hundreds, thousands of enemies and believing that God can bring some sort of deliverance. So he's a man of faith. He's a man of courage and bravery. These are some of the characteristics of Jonathan. So this is the first snapshot that we get of his life. Snapshot number two comes several chapters later in 1 Samuel 18. This is right after the famous story of David and Goliath where David defeats this giant. And this is where the close friendship of David and Jonathan begins to form. And in 1 Samuel 18, three through nine, it says, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. So his response to David's success, some scholars say that this act might've symbolized Jonathan transferring the kingdom to David or at the very least recognizing that there was some kind of plan and purpose on David's life. He's stripping himself of his robe and giving it to him. Think about, he's celebrating the successes of others. Now, contrast that with his father. As we continue reading in verse five, it says, and David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistines, the women came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Not, not a great song to sing when you have a jealous king ruling over Israel. And so Saul, it says Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000 and they have ascribed only thousands to me. What more can he have but the kingdom? Already he's starting to have this fear that his kingdom is gonna be taken over by David. And it says that Saul eyed David from that day on. So Saul is, he's envious, he's jealous, he's spiteful. 
Jonathan, on the other hand, he's celebrating the successes of others. And in, and in this snapshot, you can see a, a humility in Jonathan. I mean, he's, he's the prince. He's the king's son. And he's stripping himself of his robe and giving it to this man who's victorious because he recognizes something of God on this moment. So he's a, he's a man of faith, courage, bravery. He's a man of humility. Then in snapshot three, 1 Samuel chapter 20, Saul is having this conversation with his son, Jonathan, because he's really starting to get afraid of the influence that David is having. And this is what Saul tells Jonathan in 1 Samuel 20, verses 31 through 33. He says, for as long as the son of Jesse, who's David, as long as he lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. So even at the risk of his father trying to kill him, Jonathan is standing up for David. So it shows a, a man of selflessness. He's, he's not putting his own interest in mind in the moment. He's putting his own life on the line as he's standing up for his friend. It shows that he's a man of integrity, of consistency. And then the last snapshot, snapshot number four, at the end, 1 Samuel chapter 31 through one through two. It says, now the Philistines were fighting against Israel and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain at Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. Here's, here's the amazing thing about this is as flawed as Saul was, he was still the king that God had anointed at that time. As flawed as he was, as toxic, toxic as he was, he was the king that was anointed. And even though Jonathan was serving under this toxic king, under this bad leader, he still to the very end submitted to the fact that God had made his father king over Israel. He was walking in submission to authority. He continued to serve him as they fought God's enemies, even to his own death. And so these, these other characteristics of Jonathan, you see that he's a, a man of loyalty. He's a man of submission. He's submitting to authority and in the kingdom of God, you can never be a person of authority if you're unwilling to submit to authority. So he submits to authority. He's a, he's, he's a man of loyalty, even up until death. And so over the course of these several chapters, we get snapshots into the type of person Jonathan is. And you see his character contrasted with that of his father. Saul was fearful and fear, uh, faithless. Jonathan was brave and faithful. Saul was jealous and spiteful. Jonathan was selfless and encouraging. Saul was rash and disobedient. Jonathan was submissive and loyal. And here's where I'm going with this, is that Jonathan is every bit the man that his father Saul should have been. Jonathan would have been the king his father should have been. But we all know that not Jonathan, but David was chosen as king. And this is the question that I got stuck with. I was like, why not Jonathan? Like if, if you're looking for a king, a, a man after your own heart, why did he have to go into the shepherd fields to find David? Like, what about Jonathan? I mean, he was brave, he was fearful or faithful, he was selfless, he was humble, loyal, submissive to authority, a man of integrity. He exemplified the very traits of what you would expect a man after God's own heart to be. He was everything that his father should have been. He was everything you could have asked for in a king. Why not Jonathan? And you might say that it's because God was completely removing the kingdom um, and the kingship away from Saul, even by removing it from his family line. And maybe that had something to do with it. But as I wrestled with this question, at the end of the day, this is the only answer to the question that I could come up with to the question, why not Jonathan? And it's simply because God chose David. At the end of the day, Jonathan was qualified. 
He could have been in that position. At the end of the day, God chose David. And this is the part that really spoke to me in this story. Even though Jonathan had every good characteristic of a king, God chose David and David goes on to be one of the most influential and recognizable persons in scripture. David's life is mentioned as one of the heroes of faith later on in Hebrews 11. Most non-Christians know who David is because the story of David and Goliath, it's, it's iconic, like it, it, it resonates with people. And Jonathan's life kind of ends up in the shadows. His life ended tragically too soon and you don't hear much about Jonathan after his death while David's legacy lives on. Now, obviously Jonathan has more notoriety than the average person because we read about him in the pages of scripture, but his life is a whisper compared to the attention that David gets. It's small compared to the attention that David gets. And there's something in Jonathan that resonated with me and that I think can resonate with us. Typically, um, we, or at least I, read through the narrative of scripture and we tend to identify with the great heroes of faith. And we should identify with them because there's much in their stories that resonate with us, right? Even if it's David, whether it's God taking David, who was a nobody shepherd and making him a king of Israel, like that, that's relatable, we can relate to that. Maybe it's God taking Moses, who was a fearful stutterer, and God saying, I'm gonna make you my voice for my people to bring deliverance out of Egypt. That's relatable. Or maybe it's God using Esther, a simple Jewish girl, to turn the heart of a pagan king and bring salvation to his people. We can see ourselves in their story because we're ordinary people, believing that God can use our lives for great things and their stories connect with us because they were simple. And in their simplicity, God in his providence and in his, and in his sovereignty, he chose to use in mighty ways. And these heroes of faith, they inspire us to trust and believe God for whatever, whatever his will is in our lives, whether it feels impossible or seems impossible or not. And that's a good thing that should inspire us and encourage us. But here's what I resonate with in Jonathan's story and, and what captivated me in this is for every David story, there are thousands of Jonathan stories. For every David story, there are thousands of Jonathan stories. In other words, for every story of a man or woman used greatly by God, if you think of the David Wilkerson's, the Billy Graham's, the Corey Ten Booms, there are thousands of men and women God uses with a whisper. Their lives won't be marked with grandiose, Theosity, their stories won't be the ones told for generations. They won't have books written about their life. Their names will only be remembered on a gravestone, but their faithfulness and the impact they had has been marked in heaven. And there are thousands of Jonathans amongst us. I believe that God has an amazing plan for every person's life in this room. I, b I believe God has an amazing plan for my life, but what if that amazing plan is a whisper? What if that amazing plan is better measured by our faithfulness in what we do rather than the greatness of the results of what we do? Eugene Peterson, a minister and theologian best known for his work, the message translation of the Bible, tells a story in his biography that exemplifies this principle perfectly today. In his biography, he recounts a story that took place in his 20s and he's finishing up his second year at a Christian university and he's traveling back home to Montana. And he said he didn't know why, but as he's coming home after a second year of Bible school, he just felt dead inside. He'd never felt this way before. He grew up in, in Christian circles, but he just felt dead inside. He said it felt like his soul was withering and he didn't know why. And so when he gets home after two years of Bible school, he goes to his pastor with these feelings. And after a couple times talking with his pastor, he says he stopped going because his pastor just wouldn't listen to him. His pastor had an idea of what was wrong and kept railing on the same thing and, and he wouldn't listen to him. He had this aching heart and didn't feel heard. And so he's like, he stopped going to his pastor after a couple times. Next, he went to a 
man that people referred to as Brother Ned. Brother Ned was this very saintly figure in the church and he would expound on the Bible, very wise man when it came to expounding on the Bible. And so Eugene said that he would sit and he would just expound on the Bible for hours. But once again, he said he did all the talking and it didn't seem to be helping him, it, it, it bored him. And so finally, a friend suggested that he talk to a man named Reuben Lance. And I wanna read you some snippets out of the book about this man, Reuben Lance. In his biography, this is what it says. It says, Reuben carried his burly frame and surly disposition onto every job site, plumbing, carpentry, masonry, and electrical. Reuben could fix anything and could beat most any man into the dust. He was the kind of man you wanted at, on your side when you confronted hooligans in a dark alley. Reuben was not a man you went to with an aching heart. Eugene approached Reuben and nervously explained what he was feeling. Could he talk with Reuben? Reuben's answer was brisk. If that's what you want, meet me in the church basement after supper on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It says Reuben Lance, the man who never smiled, never prayed aloud in church and was scornful of, what, of most of what passed for religion became Eugene's first spiritual director. For the remaining weeks of that summer, they met twice a week. No pious language, no heavy theology. Eugene said, he just talked to me. He treated me like a person. And when I got back to school, I was different. It would be years before Eugene could describe what he had experienced that summer with Reuben. During seminary, Eugene wrote the story of his relationship with Reuben, describing how an unsophisticated man with no formal theological training who talked to Eugene mostly about everyday stuff, tools and work and landscape, school, how he had such a massive impact on his life. Reuben simply listened and treated Eugene with dignity. Reuben never viewed Eugene as an opportunity for ministry, but welcomed him as a stance of wonderment. Decades later, Eugene's brother-in-law, who knew Reuben, gave Eugene Reuben's contact information. Eugene dialed the number, and Reuben, then in his 80s, answered. Eugene explained to Reuben his profound influence with only long silence coming from the end of the line. Eventually, Reuben's frail voice broke the stillness. You know, I'm just sitting here in my bed. I'm very ill and I can't do much. And you're telling me that those Thursday nights at the church changed your life. No one's ever said anything like that to me before. They liked me to fix things for them, but they never seemed to want me for much more than that. And it says, and Reuben cried. See, tens of millions of people are familiar with the name Eugene Peterson or at least familiar with his works and his impact. Next to no one knew the name Reuben Lance. His life wasn't marked by great results, but it was marked by faithfulness. It was marked by stewardship. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 25 conveying the importance of stewardship and faithfulness where we're at. And in this parable, a wealthy man entrusts three of his servants with his property while he goes away on this long journey. And to one servant, he gives five talents. To another servant, he gives two talents. And to the last servant, he gives one talent. Some scholars say that a talent was equivalent to about 20 years worth of wages. So it was, it was a lot of money that this, this master was leaving with these servants. And it says that the servants with five and two talents, they invest what they've been given and they double it. And the servant with one talent hides the money away out of fear. So when the master comes back, the servant that was given five talents produces 10 talents. And the, the servant that was given two talents produces four talents. But I want you to notice what the master says to the men who stewarded their talents well. I want you to see if you can spot the difference. So to the man with five talents, in Matthew 25, 21, this is what the master said. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Then to the man with two talents, in verse 23, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Did you catch the difference? Let me read them one more time. 
to the first one, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And then to the second servant, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. See, it's a trick question. There is no difference. And that's so important. I love what the Faith Life Study Bible says. It says that faithful stewardship pleases the master more than the actual return on his investment. Faithful stewardship pleases the master more than the actual return on his investment. Both servants doubled their profits, but in raw numbers, the first servant yielded more than two times as much as the second servant. servant. But they were both told the same thing. You see, Jonathan entered into heaven to the same words David did. Reuben entered into heaven to the same words that Eugene did. You've heard it said to be faithful in the little things and God will give you responsibility in greater things. Perhaps your view of God's amazing plan for your life, perhaps you view it as the arrival of that greater responsibility that comes with your faithfulness in the little. But what if the greater responsibility comes and goes unnoticed? Jonathan was faithful in the little, so God gave him greater responsibility, not by making him king, but by bringing a king into his life who needed a faithful companion. Reuben was faithful in the little, so God gave him greater responsibility, not by making him a pastor, but by bringing a pastor of a generation to him so that he could minister to his life in a time when he desperately needed it. And the reason that I speak this message is because at times it seems like there's a lot out there encouraging the Davids of our generation to step out in faith and to walk in God's calling. And we need that because we have Davids in our generation. But there are many Jonathans out there that need to be encouraged to live free from the pressure and regret of not living out David's calling. Jonathan's father told him, you will be king. The army of Israel expected Jonathan as the prince to become king. The prevailing norms and customs of that era said it was Jonathan's right to become king. Jonathan had everything it took to become a king. Yet God said, David is to be king. And Jonathan walked in his lane in faithfulness and integrity and the world is better because of it. His story might not come with the same grandiosity as David's, but in heaven's metrics, it matters just as much. What is is your story? Maybe you felt like your life is somewhat insignificant, that it should be more. Maybe that you've missed out on God's plan or will for your life because it's not what others thought it would be or it's not what you thought it would be. Maybe you say, I I just work at the factory down the road. Then work and commit to that as though God is your boss and not the toxic manager that you dread seeing every day. You might say, I just stay at home raising the kids. Then raise your kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Show them by your actions what it means to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You might say, I'm just getting ready to go back to school. Then study with purpose and fervor. Be the student who won't allow anybody to sit by themselves in the corner of the lunchroom. You might say, I'm just a pastor of a small country church. Then shepherd that community with patience and endurance, whether the pews fill to capacity or not. Walk in your lane with faithfulness and integrity. Because here's the, here's the thing. If, if you're living out the Great Commission in your context, meaning making disciples, if if, if you're living your life loving God fully and loving others in your context, if you're always striving to walk by the Spirit and exemplify His fruits in your life and stay sensitive to His leading, I'm telling you, God's amazing plan for your life doesn't have to be a future event. It starts today. And, And understanding that is so important because if your real ministry your, your real calling, your, God's real plan for you is always a future event. It's hard to be invested in the present. 
because the present is always downplayed to a future that may never come because God might not have asked you to become king. Maybe God's plan is not that you change lanes, but that you continue to steward the lane you're in well. Or some of you, maybe you need to be challenged to actually start stewarding the lane you're in rather than waiting for it to change. And if I'm honest, this is a tension that ebbs and flows in my life and ministry. I I get those times where I feel like, man, my life should be more. I'm 34 years old. I I should have accomplished more by now. I should have greater results in my life. I never know what the more is, just that it should be more, right? Right? And as I daydream about what the more could or should be, it it becomes easy to sacrifice the present on the altar of an idea of the future. And so in in this story, I was challenged, steward where I'm at well. God has an amazing plan for your life. It may be loud, it may be a whisper. It might produce five talents, it might produce two talents. It may make you a famous king or it may make you a forgotten prince. It might make you a pastor of a generation or it might make you an overlooked handyman. Either way, your story, my story matters in the kingdom of God because God has placed the primary significance on the stewardship of your context rather than the amount of return on investment. So, My encouragement, my challenge this morning, walk in your context in faithfulness and integrity. Don't don't downplay it because it's not a heroic David-like story. You may be there the rest of your life or God may call you to something else. Either way, God has an amazing plan on your life. Amen? Would you stand with me? God, I thank you for the purpose that you have endowed on every life in this room. God, sometimes when we hear of the amazing plan you have for our lives, maybe we have ideas of what that's supposed to look like and we've been disappointed. God, but when we are found in you as sons and daughters of God, and and it doesn't matter what we're doing in, in vocational ministry, working in business, in the workforce, God, if we're stewarding those areas well, God, we are living your incredible plan for our life. And we never know, we never know the small impacts that we have in our life. Reuben had no clue how much he impacted a a pastor that impacted millions. Yet he found out at the end of his life. Some of us may never find out the full impact. God, but I pray that we would be encouraged to steward our areas well in our families, in our, in our workplace. If we're going to school, God, whatever it is, let us steward those areas well. And I pray that we could find great purpose in that. God, I, I don't wanna live my life thinking of what it should be or what it could be. God, let me just be present where I'm at. And if you change the story, if, if it's loud or if it's a whisper, if it's this or that, God, whatever you want, God, I, I wanna steward it well in the place that I'm at. And I pray that we could all be encouraged to do that because you have an incredible plan for our life. In Jesus' name, amen.